Good morning and welcome to the uh, third meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Um, may I remind everyone in the public gallery to switch off any devices that might interfere with proceedings. Item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. We now come to our inquiry in Scotland's economic performance and today we have from the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, first of all, David Wilson, the Commissioner, um, Mary Spowage, Deputy Chief Executive, John Ireland, the Chief Executive, and David Stone, Head of Economy and Income Tax Forecasting. So welcome to all four of you this morning, and thank you for coming in. And I think we have a statement, first of all, from David Wilson, so I'll hand over to you at this point. Okay, thank you, Convener, and good morning. Everyone, uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to come um, in and give give evidence this morning. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I, as you'll know, we published our first report as a statutory organisation um, on December the 14th, alongside the Scottish Budget, uh, and that report includes uh, a number of forecasts, particularly on the economy, which will be the, of particular interest to you this morning, but also our forecasts of the likely income from the devolved taxes and expenditure on the um, demand-led uh, expenditure on Social Security uh, in Scotland, but our focus will mainly be on the economy this morning. Now, our report included a, a set of forecasts for GDP, for onshore GDP, for five years uh, going forward. Uh, our understanding is this is probably the first time that uh, any organisation has made forecasts over that time period, uh, and we hope it will be of relevance and, and use to your uh, inquiry um, on the performance of, of the Scottish economy. Uh, the report provides a range of detail. Uh, there's a lot of numbers in it. We're very conscious of that, and we're delighted to explain any aspects of the detail that's, that's included in the report. We're also happy to provide any additional, uh, if you want them, any additional uh, detail, any additional numbers, breakdowns um, that, that, uh, that we, we have. Um, the report did include the, the most important aspects, um, and we also published a set of uh, spreadsheets and additional uh, detail um, on our website uh, on the, the 14th alongside our report. Now, one of the main conclusions that we have come to in our overall assessment of the, uh, the, the Scottish economy is a, a forecast of um, what we've described as subdued economic growth over the next uh, five years. There's a number of factors that uh, un underpin that. But perhaps just to draw out a couple of the, the key points um, f from that. The first is we've taken a, a balanced approach trying to take into account the long run performance of the Scottish economy, both before the financial crash and in the period thereafter, and particularly taken into account the most recent uh, in information over the last uh, two to three years, and tried to draw a, a set of um, assessment or a set of you know, detailed uh, bits of thinking around how the, the economy might um, roll out over the next uh, five years or so. Um, just to pick up a couple of key points in that. Um, overall, since the financial crash, I think everyone will be aware that uh, growth has been very weak by, is, uh, by international um, and historic uh, standards, but that has been the case both at the UK level and uh, internationally. Um, what we've what we've tried to assess is how that might continue or how, we, how far and how quickly we may get back to the levels of historic economic growth that we saw prior to the, to the financial crash. Uh, and our, our overall assessment is that it will uh, indeed take some time to return to the, those historic levels and that the part, part of perhaps the key message of the report is managing our expectations about how quickly we may return to those levels of, of historic economic growth, which is a feature both at the uh, Scottish level but at the, the UK level. Secondly, we tried to draw out a number of particular factors that have impacted and affected Scottish economic um, activity over the last um, five years or so. Uh, and particularly, we identified uh, some particular factors in the early part of this decade, particularly in construction uh, and in oil and gas activity. 
that ha had the impact of um, how, we might, how we put it as buoying up economic growth. There is a number of particular strengths in that period. Um, that have actually come through in the, the overall uh, all data and overall assessment. But at least some of them, particularly mentioning construction and oil and gas, have weakened and moderated in the most, re most recent path. Um, and what we, our assessment in, in going forward is that those, uh, perhaps those two key factors, and there's, another, uh, there's an, a number of other ones that we, we may get into, um, are unlikely to be uh, providing the boost to economic activity that they did do in the early part of, of this decade. And that's perhaps a key second factor alongside the, the overall um, weakening of international economic growth that, that led to our conclusions uh, going forward. Um, perhaps the key thing to emphasise is the importance of underlying productivity to the overall performance of the economy. Productivity is absolutely key to our forecasts, and we can unpack and give you slightly more detail on that. Um, and two other things that we just want to mention in the, the opening comments that we can get into in a bit more detail are, uh, firstly, population projections, which are a key part both of, of the, the size of GDP going forward, what it means for G GDP per head in Scotland, which is a key factor driving uh, incomes, um, and also what, what it may mean in terms of the workings of the labour market going forward. So population projections are a, a key additional factor, which we'd be happy to answer questions on. Um, and secondly, the impact or potential impact of the change in the relationship with the EU for the UK as a whole and for Scotland uh, in particular, which is a, 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 an issue we've taken a, a broad-based uh, judgment on as part of our uh, forecasts, um, and they, they are factored uh, into our assessment. Uh, perhaps the final thing just to mention is, uh, as one forecaster uh, put it, um, that over the last seven or eight years, um, the, the, in terms of productivity, there's been, uh, and I'm, I'm quoting from the National Institute here, um, that productivity has surprised for forecasters to the downside. Uh, in other words, many people have had disappointed expectations around the, uh, the possible growth in productivity. Um, but employment has surprised on the upside. Uh, in other words, there's been uh, very high levels of employment uh, activity, historic low levels of unemployment. Um, and one of the factors we've taken into account is that these are two sides of perhaps the same coin. This is the current um, f set of features of both the Scottish and the UK economy. Um, and they are a, a key aspect of our forecast going forward, with which, while much of the uh, emphasis and comment on our forecast has been around the uh, subdued nature of our productivity and growth projections, it's worth emphasising that that is going alongside historically high levels of employment and low levels of unemployment, um, which we expect to continue uh, in, the, in the period uh, going forward. So that's just an overview, some introductory remarks, and we're delighted to take uh, questions and give you further details. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with some questions from Gillian Martin. Um, right, I, I, your forecasts are, they paint a, quite a weak picture um, of, of productivity. I just want to pick up more your last point there, just to get some clarification. You said employment's up, and we know that, but productivity is down. That means you make the correlation between productivity and household incomes and earning is, is, is down. Does that tend to mean that jobs are not paying as well as they did? I, I think that's a, a fair uh, summary. I think what we've seen is very high levels of employment, low levels of, of unemployment, um, but relatively flat uh, real wages over the last uh, most recent period. Uh, and again, what, one of the, uh, the issues, uh, one of the statistics that we forecast is uh, an assessment for real wages. So over the long term, you'd expect there to be a fairly close link between the growth of productivity and the growth of um, well, particularly nominal wages and income, which is the key driver of the, the, the you know, pounds that people have in their pocket. That's what you'd expect. But how that works out on a uh, you know, month by month and a year by year, year basis um, is one of the 
parts of the complex picture that we're, we're, we're facing uh, at the moment. Um, and many people have described the situation that we're in is one where we have a low productivity but high employment uh, scenario, equilibrium, however you want to describe it. And again, that's the feature that, that we're in. So what, one of the, the things that we've taken particular care in looking at um, is if you I imagine a situation where our productivity performance going forward markedly improves. For example, if we're in a situation where productivity, great, productivity growth greatly exceeds what we're expecting, then that might have an impact on um, or might be part of uh, potentially less people in employment um, and vice versa. So productivity and levels of employment are very closely interact, interact with each other. So, so policy decisions around fair work are probably going to make quite a big difference to that. Um, I, I want to ask you about some other po ask if you took into account other policy decisions that have been, been made when you were making your assessment. For example, increased childcare, uh, digital access, particularly in rural areas where obviously productivity is lower as a result of not having digital access, and things like um, improved transport infrastructure. So the fair work agenda and all those things, are they, are they taken into account as you make your projections? Um, so, y yes and no to some, to some extent. I, I think you're absolutely right. All of the examples that you gave, perhaps particularly the, uh, the fair work uh, agenda, are critical to um, measures that the, the government can take to support individual businesses, improve their productivity, and ideally, in a, f a fair work uh, situation, both increase productivity and maintain and potentially increase um, levels of employment. That's an agenda which may address the underlying um, weaker than expected productivity levels uh, in the economy. So yes, these are all crucial factors in impacting on the performance of the economy. Um, where I mean this, a slight yes and no answer is the way we develop our forecasts um, is not a, um, almost a policy by policy assessment of the impact of um, the fair work agenda or transport policies or enterprise policies and then try and develop uh, a set of impacts of each of those policies to lead to uh, a, a, a set of forecasts for the economy. That's not how we do things and I think that would be exceptionally difficult to do. So we, we don't make individual assessments or evaluate policies um, like fair work in, in detail and feed that through to our projections. What we instead do is develop a set of, and we have a number of modelling um, <coughs> capabilities, which we use to uh, make judgments about overall productivity, about population, around the other key drivers of the economy, and that gives us our, our overall assessment. So in that sense, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't say we're, there's a, a direct link that you could unpack in our numbers which show the impact of fair work or the impact of the other policies. Yeah, I've just got one, one other question around household incomes, household earnings. You say that, and I've got it here, that uh, real household incomes will not recover to the 2007 levels until 2022. And I get what you were saying around oil and gas, and that's particular interest in my area, being in Aberdeenshire, and, and certainly that's the case that people have, have lost a, a lot, of, lot of work and earnings are going down. Um, how do you assess what household incomes are going to be based on the data that you have now? Right, I'll perhaps ask one of my colleagues to give you a more yeah. uh, detailed assessment of it, but again, it's part of our overall um, model of the Scottish economy, which um, builds up you know, assessments based on productivity, population and everything else, which gives us um, a, a set of detailed estimates of both nominal and real wages going forward, which is the, the key driver of, of, of household uh, incomes. Uh, again, it's all part of a consistent story around the future of, of the economy. Perhaps if I could ask you know, David to give you a bit more detail about precisely how we do that. Sure. Uh, so for uh, household incomes, historically, we look at national accounts data. That's where we get most of our information on historic incomes from. For the forecast, uh, wages broadly grow in line with productivity, so the real wage uh, will increase as productivity increases, but because we have very muted growth in productivity, you get very limited growth in real wages. When you combine that with higher levels of inflation, that brings down um, 
uh, that brings down real wages to some extent. And also because we've got slower employment growth over the next few years than we had historically, that also slows down growth in real household income. Uh, so we've got, because we've got a growing total population as well, uh, that reduces real disposable household income per capita over the next few years. But again, it doesn't take into account things like increased childcare remain, mean that there's two people working in it, will be able to work in a household as a result, result of that policy in the future. It doesn't take into in it. Okay. No, our work can't take into account sort of individual okay. policies Thank like you. that. Thank you. I don't know if it's just worth adding here that all these policies are around childcare and things, for example, which have been going on in the past, will be influencing the data that we look at. So it's not that we're completely ignoring the impact of those policies. You know, the historical impact is, is, is there in the sort of the historical data and we project forward. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. And now Gordon MacDonald. Uh, we've obviously talked quite a lot about productivity, but I was wanting to expand on that. My understanding is that most productivity gains come from the private sector of the economy. So um, what tools are available to governments to influence productivity? Um, well, there's a slight risk in giving you a detailed answer to that if they're going beyond our particular remit. I mean, our remit is clearly to produce the forecast of the economy rather than to assess policy <laughs> options um, for the government. To, I'm trying but, to understand why your um, levels of productivity growth for Scotland are lower than the UK as a whole. And I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the things that influence uh, productivity, like uh, inward migration of skilled labour, um, raising the national minimum wage, uh, tax breaks on new technology, etc. Well, these, you know, again, you've started a, a very good list there in terms of the the interventions that that governments uh, can make and in Scotland have been making, um, both in the recent past and over a, over a long period. Perhaps just to pick up, you know, a couple of um, you know the headline messages in that. Um, the perhaps the key thing underpinning the future. Um, you know, development both of productivity and in turn for economic growth uh, overall um, is the technological progress. It's the extent to which um, you know, the, the economy and perhaps particular uh, sections of it can basically produce you know, more outputs with uh, less inputs or, or the, the, the same inputs. Um, and what, what we have been uh, I'm going to see and what is underpinning the productivity performance of the UK and the, the, the Scottish economy is that that technological progress that is, you know, through innovation appears to be weakening or not is, has not been achieving the levels of uh, productivity improvement that we have been seeing in the past. Uh, and perhaps the key explanation of that is it just appears to be getting altogether more difficult to produce the, um, the innovations and the productivity enhancements uh, in the economy than perhaps it was um, in certain periods um, in, you know, in, in history. People have drawn attention to things like Moore's Law in, um, in computing, where there's the, um, the ever-expanding uh, increase in computing power. That, that uh, increase in computing power has been getting more, more slow increase um, over time and it's been getting more expensive to deliver over time and that's perhaps both an important factor in its own right but a wider a wider metaphor for, for the challenges that we face. So innovation is getting more difficult um, and that's what that appears to be flowing through to the more challenging um, uh, uh, economic uh, performance. So clearly one of the key things that governments can do to support is to um, work ever harder still to support innovation activity, um, whether it's in the private sector or in the university sector and, and other areas that can support uh, R&D. So more interventions to support innovation R&D are absolutely critical in this as are measures to ensure that the, the innovations that are already out there are being in the language that there's a, a diffusion into the wider economy. In other words, businesses are actually taking advantage of what the best businesses out there are already doing, um, which again is an important uh, factor in this. And this is the, um, the, the set of activities that the enterprise bodies are, are very active in, that the Funding Council are supporting in, in, in universities and, and others. Um, perhaps a, a, an additional element just to draw out, and again, it's a particular feature of the moment, 
um, is that the, um, the key driver of technological improvements and progress and, and, and productivity, um, it won't happen unless there's high levels of investment in the economy both in terms of investment by businesses in their own businesses um, and investment by government and, and collectively in uh, investment in overall infrastructure um, and skills uh, to make sure that we have the, the capability as an economy to support individual businesses uh, going forward. Um, a particular challenging feature of the economy, um, and people at a UK level have drawn this out quite, quite uh, sharply, is um, in international terms relatively low investment in um, overall skills and overall um, you know, public investment in infrastructure. And again, that's an area that the gov government, both UK and the Scottish level, are taking um, actions to, to enhance. So they're perhaps the key areas to draw out, but there's a whole range of different matters. We've touched on fair, fair work and others that are going forward, but investment and technology, perhaps the key things to, to draw out. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to add any particular to that. Just perhaps the comparison with the UK that you mentioned, um, as David said, um, our approach to modelling the economy is very much looking at recent, um, and by recent we mean last five to ten years of data, and, and drawing out the trends and seeing what, how that can inform us about our projections going forward. Um, uh, historically, Scottish productivity growth has been slower than the UK's, and in the last few years that's, that trend has continued. Towards the end of the forecast horizon, though, whilst... Um, we're not quite at the same level of the UK um, by, the, by the end. We're catching up um, a little bit in our forecast, and we're not too far apart by the end of our forecast in terms of productivity growth. Yeah, I noticed the difference was only 0.2 at the, at the end of your uh, forecast. But, you know, given that we've always had this um, discrepancy between Scotland and UK productivity growth, how much of that is down to the fact that many of the policy levers that are available to government aren't available to Scotland? Because the economy as the UK as a whole isn't even. I mean, different parts of the UK have got different um, key industries, if you like. So, you know, how much, how much of an influence is that on Scotland's productivity growth? I'd say that's a very difficult question to, to answer really get to, you know, at, at a high level. I think there's probably a number of factors that you would want to, to look at um, in terms of different structures of the, the Scottish economy, different, um, you know, the, the overall um, demographics and structure. The, the Scottish economy do differ from the UK economy, which at particular periods in time has been to our benefit and at particular periods of time um, um, has, has led to some weakness in, in the Scottish economy. I've touched on the particular feature over the last uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years has been mm -hmm. the overall positive impact of the oil and gas sector that has had a very considerable impact on the productivity performance of the, the Scottish economy, and that's been one of the many um, you know, positive factors. But if you look in terms of something like the overall UK structure of the economy, perhaps particularly with the financial sector in, in, in London and the South East and the innovation performance in London and the South East, that is a set of factors that um, is l less in prominence in Scotland. So differences in structure are perhaps the principal explanation for, for differences between Scotland and, and UK uh, economic uh, performance. And that's what our modelling work seeks to assess rather than looking at in any great detail at a micro level about the impact of particular and just to add, as, as you touched upon, you know, the performance of different parts of the UK economy are, are very different. You know, so it is quite difficult to look at the UK in aggregate because London and the South East are so different from many other parts of the economy. Um, and England for the nor North East, North West, you know, the experience <coughs> that these parts of the country are having are, is very different to the um, London, South East, the East of England as well, which are, you know, tend to be more high productivity areas of the UK. I was just going to move on to uh, GDP per capita. Um, your GDP per capita figures are much more pessimistic uh, than for the UK as a whole. And I was wondering how much of that um, percentage increase was based on the fact that, you know, Scotland is already starting from quite a high base. Um, so in comparison of the Eurostat uh, data that was released in 2017, you're looking at um, Wales and Northern Ireland 
has a per capita GP GDP of around about €22,000, and Scotland, including uh, offshore, is uh, sitting about €32,000. And I'm just wondering how much of that has an influence on uh, your percentage growth? Um, perhaps, again, I'll look to, to my colleagues to give you a more specific answer about the GDP per capita figures. But one of the, perhaps, particular features of the performance of the, the, the Scottish economy um, in, the, in the relatively recent past has, has been that um, the, a convergence of GDP per capita between Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, which, again, one of the, the key things that we hope we try and do in, in our reports, and one of the things yet we all have to be very careful about is being very precise about what we're comparing things against. But in terms of GDP per capita, there's been uh, a degree of convergence with the rest of the UK, such that at the points of my GDP per capita in Scotland has been fairly well you know, at the, the same level as for the UK um, as a whole. Um, and at least part in that has been the interplay between GDP growth, um, but particularly our relatively weaker population growth in Scotland. And because there's been lower population growth, then that, that has meant that uh, GDP per capita has been relatively um, you know, st stronger. Um, one of the, the factors, and I touched on it earlier, is um, trying to make an assessment of what that might mean going forward. Because one of the, and I think I would say one of the concerns that we do have is um, if there is a weakening of population growth in Scotland, that on the face of it might lead to sort of slight, uh, it could, it could lead to improvements in GDP per capita in the sense of this, if there's less people but we manage to produce the, 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 the same um, goods or, or, grow, or, or grow. But in terms of the overall development of the economy as a whole and in terms of the, the richness and the, um, of, of the labour market, that might lead to um, so, you know, downsides to that as well. So how the population of Scotland goes forward with a particular factor of the um, change in the relationship with, with the EU will be a key factor un uh, um, underpinning both our GDP forecasts and how that plays out in terms of, of GDP uh, per capita. But just in terms of, of headlines, we, Scotland is more in or around the same level as the UK as a whole, and Scotland has consistently um, been uh, had higher GDP per capita levels than, as you mentioned, Wales and Northern Ireland, which again underpins Mary's point about the, the richness and diversity within the UK in terms of overall economic performance. Yeah. Yeah, and just to add, to figure three in our summary sort of shows the, the GDP um, growth and the GDP per person or per capita growth um, over the forecast horizon. And you can see that there's, there's, there is a, quite a difference between the, the GDP growth overall, but, you know, they're much closer together for GDP per capita growth, which really just underlines the challenges, of the demographic challenges we have for total GDP in Scotland. Um, that, by the end of the forecast horizon, they're broadly similar in terms of GDP per capita, but the population differences are, um, are really significant in terms of GDP overall. Yeah. And just my final point is, in relation to GDP growth per capita, you said that the relationship with the EU uh, might influence how that figure moves. Can you just explain what you've built into your forecast in terms of um, Brexit, in terms of access to European labour, skilled labour, etc.? What we've done in that is we, you know, to underpin our forecasts, both in terms of um, overall GDP, but also crucially for our um, fiscal forecasts as well, we, we have to make an assessment of what we think will be the Scottish population over the next five years. Um, what we've, we've done in order to do that, we take the projections that are produced by um, the Office of National Statistics and the National R Records for Scotland. So there's a set of projections which are produced, um, you know, um, which, um, and it's very important to emphasise that these are projections as opposed to forecasts. Now, there's a lot of jargon in this world, but I think what the um, ONS are seeking to emphasise in that is that what they, they extrapolate some known and existing trends going forward. They don't produce a statistical model that, that somehow it, it takes fully into account what might happen, whether it's with a change relationship with, with Europe or, or any other factor. 
but what they produce is a set of projections and a number of variants of those projections. Um, and we, we made the judgments that we need that rather than uh, as we might have done or we could have done, um, produce our own forecasts. Um, we were very clear we wanted to use one of the variants prepared by the, the ONS. Um, uh, but we, we had to make the judgment about which of those variants. Um, back in um, the late last year, they produced a set of forecasts which took into account a set of possible um, impacts of the, um, of the changes in the UK's relationship with, with Europe. Um, and we, we decided that the, the most likely um, projection would be the one that reduced the in-migration it will reduce both in and out migration um, to the European Union from the, fr from the UK over, over the period going forward around, to around half the, the, the sort of levels that, 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 it, that it has been. Um, and that led to a set of uh, numbers that we included in all our forecasts. And that's what's called the, the EU 50% um, forecast, um, as opposed to what we might use, which is the principal projection going forward. Now, a key thing to emphasise, uh, and I said this to the F um, Finance and Constitution Committee as well, in terms of the five-year period going forward, the impact of a changed um, projection in terms of um, you know, interaction with the EU in terms of our forecasts makes a very, very small change to our GDP and GDP per capita. It's, it's a very, very small impact in the short term, but cumulatively over the longer term, and particularly if the forecasts are more pessimistic than we've assumed, this become, you know, the population it, uh, becomes a crucially important point. So it's simultaneously, in terms of our forecasts, a relatively minor factor, um, but in terms of the big picture going forward, um, it's actually a, a, a very, very important factor over the, the longer term, depending on how this, this plays out. Okay, thanks very much. And Dean Locker. Thank you, convener. One of the central observations made by the SFC in <coughs> excuse me, your forecast is that the economy is operating at or above capacity. I'd like to explore uh, the basis for this observation. You may already have covered some of the underlying factors already, but could you explain uh, the observation uh, that the economy is operating at or, or above capacity? Because obviously what we've seen over the last um, two or three years is practically uh, zero or very low growth in the economy. Um, I'll just make some very brief comments, and again, I'll pass to one of my colleagues to give you a more detailed assessment. I think perhaps the key thing that we wanted to uh, em emphasise is that um, in terms of people's uh, uh, general expectations about the economy in a period after, uh, the, after the financial crash and the, um, the, the recession um, at the early part of, of this decade, People look at growth numbers um, of the order of 0.4% a year uh, and immediately think, well, there must be spare capacity in the economy, there must be measures that we can take to boost demand, which would lead to higher growth in the short term, and that's the, the solution. Um, I think the, the overall <coughs> assessment that I think we have, uh, have come to, and it's the assessment that certainly that the, that the Bank of England have been looking at in some detail in the past, is that actually the scope to instantaneously boost the economy um, uh, without leading to uh, you know, or boost the economy through utilising spare capacity is actually relatively limited at the moment. And one of the key driving um, pieces of evidence of that is their experience in, in the labour market. Um, you would, it would be, a, um, it would be a, a brave judgment to make to think that we have historically very high levels of employment and historically very low levels of unemployment, um, yet also conclude that there's significant spare capacity in the economy. Um, so we're no, we don't make that, that, that assessment. So broadly speaking, we feel that the, um, the Scottish economy is broadly working at its current capacity. Um, we do produce fairly fine detailed estimates of whether we're slightly above capacity or slightly below capacity, but the overall message is that we're probably at capacity with, with some, um, some variation. 
Uh, and that in itself um, tells you a lot about our overall assessment of the productive potential of the economy, which is what we model over the longer term, which fundamentally is driven by productivity. Um, and it, it's that, so our expectations of how fast the economy will grow um, in the next couple of years and over the five-year period has been um, you know, reduced well below our, you know, I think, everyone's collective expe expectations from the historical levels prior to the crash. That has brought down the, the, the path of um, economic activity going forwards, uh, and we feel we're broadly on that path um, at, at the moment. I don't know if, David, perhaps you want to just say a bit more about how we make these assessments of sure. um, capacity. A few points. So we have a small but positive output gap in our forecasts. Uh, the OBR has a small but negative output gap for the UK, but really we're very close. We're both saying that the, the economies of Scotland and the UK are close to capacity. We've come to that conclusion based on a number of factors. We have a model that looks at trends over the last few years. So things like the very low unemployment rate in Scotland, that's unprecedentedly low, uh, very high participation levels and slow growth in productivity. Um, so from looking at those trends, we thought there was a, we were close to capacity, but we look at other sources of information as well. So we look at the information that businesses are giving us. So the surveys um, of firms, things like uh, hotels, how many spare rooms do they have? Do businesses feel like they could increase production tomorrow if they had to? How much are they investing? And those surveys paint a very similar picture. You've seen the capacity in the Scottish economy being used up over the last few years. And over the last couple of years, you've seen uh, not much spare capacity in the economy to allow for faster growth. Um, thank you. If I could add one more question. Um, since the 1960s, long-term growth and the growth, growth rate in the Scottish economy has been 2.5%. Two, two we're now, if we're at capacity, at around 0.5%. What has happened to the economy structurally to reduce the inherent capacity of the economy? I, I, to some extent, and without, I, I, I don't seek to be flippant today. Anyway, that's you know the million-dollar question at the, at the moment in terms of trying to understand the productive potential of um, not just the Scottish economy but the UK uh, and and the wor world economies. Um, it's been christened the productivity puzzle. Uh, you know, many many great minds um, are, are seeking to to answer that question and. Um, Again, giving you a, um, a, a risk of, of um, slightly unclear answer, and that is we don't have the answer to that question. Um, but what, what is clear um, is that this isn't just a, a Scottish um, <coughs> challenge or, or problem that, that we face. Th this is a key factor, both at UK and, and international levels. I think it goes back to some of the points I, I was making um, earlier on that the um, the there, there seem, and some people have, have christened this um, what they've called secular stag stagnation, um, where, whereby the ability of the economy to produce the levels of economic growth of you know, two plus, uh, plus percent um, is something that um, is, is no longer within the, the capability or the capacity of the, of the economy to do. So a big element of that is managing our expectations of how that, that might go forward. But is there a, a simple explanation of that? You know, almost certainly not. But the closest and probably best explanation is, I think, what I was, was saying earlier, uh, the sense that it's becoming ever more difficult and ever more expensive to produce the, um, you know, the economic innovations that lead to technological progress, which in, in turn lead to uh, economic growth. And that that appears over the last uh, you know, 10 to 15 years to, to have, have become the story. Um, looking forward, there's a number of people um, wh wh who have been christened digital optimists that you know, very much look at the change in the nature of the digital economy um, at the moment uh, and see this as a bit of a sort of a temporary um, you know, period that uh, looking 5, 10, 15, 20 years ahead, we may well get back to higher levels of growth. So there is very much a camp that sees very significant growth um, in the future. Um, and I'm, I'm not in any sense discounting that. But over the five year period that we're looking at, we would expect the, the situation that we're facing at the moment of relatively subdued growth to continue. Thanks very much. And final question. We had last week the most recent GDP numbers for third quarter last year. Uh, was there anything in <coughs> those numbers or the commentary, the underlying analysis, that would change your outlook? 
I think the, the overall numbers were broadly on, you know, in line with what we were um, expecting. Um, I, I think um, I wouldn't say we took any satisfaction from the fact they were broadly in line with the expectation because they were, um, you know, on, on the subdued side. But in terms of the the detail playing out of the economy, nothing, le you know, there was nothing in those statistics that that led us to, um, you know. It certainly led us to any fundamental rethink, and in fact, they were very close. Uh, and particularly in terms of the, the fine detail numbers, they were extremely close to the the quarterly um, forecast that we had in our assessment. I don't know if Mario, David, do you want to add a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, one quarter's data, you know, the data can be quite volatile, and you can see different movements in different sectors. You see the sort of continuing decline in the construction industry, um, and um, production was actually quite strong, but buoyed up by one particular sector. Um, and services growth was quite sluggish. Um, but we wouldn't want to put too much weight on each quarter. These data will bobble about a little bit, um, and um, we wouldn't sort of change our long-term outlook based on one quarter, um, although it did happen this time that it was very close to what we, uh, what we forecast. So, Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Our convener, <coughs> uh, you've published central forecasts for... Uh, various metrics in the uh, economy, for example, uh, with, with variance, for example, trend unemployment, a low variant of 4% and a high of 5 um, You've explained how you chose the migration one, and you explain what the other high and low ones are. For example, you say that high average hours scenario assumes convergence of Scottish average hours with UK average hours over the forecast horizons. I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about the basis on which you chose those low and high ones. I mean, they make sense, but you could have you could have suggested it might be above the UK, the high one. So, what what was the what was the what was the thinking that lay behind the the low and high variants? I'll ask David to give you a more detailed answer to that. But as part, uh, just by way of introduction, perhaps the key point is we were very keen to include these as illustrations so people could um, get a sense of what the sensitivities might be to different judgments. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it, I don't think David will say there's any particular rocket science or you know, in-depth thinking in terms of the choice of the variants. They're designed to be illustrative, um, but perhaps if David wants to you know, give you a bit more of assessment. Sure. Uh, there's certainly no strict criteria for choosing those variants. Um, we just trying to give our users a sense of what the range of uncertainty might be. Uh, in a couple of cases, there were some uh, sort of fairly obvious choices to make, like on migration, we have the different population variants. So we looked at what the impact of using, uh, you know, different uh, population variants could have been. On average hours worked, there's been a divergence of Scotland and UK in hours worked recently. So on the one hand, we looked at what if Scottish hours met the UK to get an opposite of that. We looked at what would happen if it went in the other direction. Um, but overall, we were just trying to give the picture that it, it's really productivity that is the biggest sensitivity in our forecast. Um, selecting high and low variants for that, we used uh, the growth in productivity that we've seen over the last five or six years uh, for the low variants and compared that to the growth in productivity we saw prior to 2008, which was uh, much higher. Um, but it's hard to get those sensitivities and variants, so they're sort of directly comparable in a meaningful way. We just tried to choose numbers that would be helpful. So you say it's illustrative, but um, you've you, you just said you want to show the range, what the range of uncertainty might be. I mean, what a range of uncertainty might be. A range of uncertainty might be anything, yeah. because it's uncertain. So th they are clearly simply illustrative to help the reader, to help the policymaker, to help government um, see that if, for example, we converge with UK trends on a particular metric, that this would be the outcome. Yeah. It's very important that our users understand how uncertain these forecasts can be. Um, at the moment, we can't say how accurate our forecasts are going to be, because we don't have a forecasting history to look back on and say, well, we were you know, this right or this wrong last year. Um, over time, we'll evaluate our <laughs> forecasts, and it'll allow us to build up that picture. Uh, I suppose in the meantime, we can, we can present these illustrative sensitivities. Um, can also look at the forecasting error of organize, other organisations as a comparator. So on that question about forecasting error, or margin of error in statistics, you'd usually have a confidence interval or anything, but of course that's based on measurable data. Uh, as you just said, you're, you're forecasting um, and you don't have historic 
data, or at least you don't have good historic data to, to measure it against. Um, I mean, can you give us a kind of qualitative sense of Scottish Fiscal Commission's report in the first year of the next Parliament, for example? Um, you will, how much more confident you will be able to be about your forecasts? Uh, that's I think a, that's the, a good one. Right. So the conventional way of doing this is if you look at things like the Bank of England quarterly um, forecast, they have these fan diagrams. And these fan, fan diagrams typically show that as the forecast horizon increases, the, the area of the confidence intervals increases. So it's one very important fact when you're thinking ahead to the beginning of the next parliament. Um, but the issue that we have, as, as David has said, is because we don't have historical forecast areas, we can't produce the, those, those fan diagrams. And that means it, it sort of hampers us answering the sort of question that you're, you're answering. We don't know what our, our forecasting track record is going to be like, um, given the methods that we employ. Therefore, it's, it's pretty hard to say um, what those fan charts look like. The only thing we can say with any real confidence is that as the forecast horizon increases, the level of uncertainty will increase as well. And by the start of the next parliament, you'd expect those forecast bands. So one rises and another rises. Sorry, as the forecast horizon increases, so as we go further out, we know that the the uncertainty attached to the forecast will also increase because potential error builds upon potential error. Okay. And you remember the fan diagrams that you see in the Bank of England? Things they go like that. Yes. Um, so that's the thing we can say with great certainty. What we can't do is we can't at this stage give you a sense of how wide those 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 fans are going to be. Yeah. Perhaps can I just sort of emphasise maybe a point in this is. Everything John said is you know, clear right in terms of the uncertainty widening. Um, but two things that I think we are taking actions on to, to mitigate this to, to an extent is, you know, firstly, we will be, uh, you know, seek to be as transparent as we can be through publishing um, what we're, we will call our forecast evaluation <laughs> report. So we will produce a report uh, on, on a regular basis evaluating our own performance in forecasting. Um, uh, and that will all be part um, of um, you know, ever Im improving our modelling capability um, and evaluating um, how we're, we're performing as a forecasting organisation. And part of that will be building up the capability to, in, you know, to um, do as Bank of England and other organisations do, you know, look back at their own forecasting performance to evaluate their, you know, their, their future forecasts. So, so we will be doing all of this, but by definition, we're a new organisation. These were our first uh, forecasts. I think perhaps the other point to, to emphasise is in terms of the... The, the status and the use of our forecasts. You know, the the clear and you know most most important purpose of our forecasts is to feed into the Scottish budget on um, on an, an annual basis. Um, now that that may you know the budgeting process may well you know evolve over time and you may well um, you know see uh, multi-year budgeting and others, but our forecasts. Will um, which we and we will be undertaking, um, you know, two forecasting exercises over the year, um, and so we will be learning, and the budget can adapt to the learning. So, you know, th th this time next year we will have a new set of forecasts and a new budget, and we'll take into account all of the information uh, going forward. So, w what we would hope to do is that our our near-term forecasts are as fair and balanced as they can be, taking into account all of the information and being transparent uh, in the decision-making um, as they can. And in terms of the longer-term forecasts, in as far as they're crucially important for decision-making and for overall assessment of um, fiscal and financial matters going, for going forward, they will adapt and improve over time going forward. Can I, can I just quickly add as well, we've, in figure 1.1 .1 in our report, we've given an example of an OBR um, GDP growth forecast fan diagram, which gives you an idea of the sort of level of uncertainty that has come through their historical forecasting errors. Um, and it does give a very wide fan by the end of the period. So it gives you an idea of the sorts of um, uncertainty that we're talking about over a five year period. Um, and given Scotland's a smaller economy, um, and all of these other things, um, one may expect that the forecast errors um, may be larger for Scotland. I think that's a reasonable thing to expect. So that just gives you a feel for the, the sort of uncertainty that we're talking about when you go five years out. Okay, thanks. We'll get there. And uh, John Mason. 
<coughs> Thanks, convener. Um, the Scottish Fiscal Commission gave us uh, evidence during our previous study, which was on economic data, and you kind of highlighted that there was a few areas that there seemed to be either you didn't have a lot of information or it was difficult to get. I think earnings was one of these and Scottish specific prices was one of these. So I'm just wondering how that has impacted on your forecasts. Have you been able to work your way around that or there are other caveats because you just couldn't get some of that information? I think perhaps the, the headline response to that, and then perhaps ask um, maybe Mary to um, follow up, is I, I think the, the issue about earnings, uh, it, it uh, perhaps remains the, the core area that if we're going to find answers to these questions of the interaction between productivity and employment um, and how the, the economy at, the, at present is performing, the performance of the labour market is absolutely critical to that. So any in, improved information we have about the particular features and experience of the, of the labour market, um, you know, more uh, more current than they are at the moment will be, I think, of huge value to uh, not just us, but to a range of government um, organisations in understanding what is going on at the moment. So the, the earnings issue remains critical. Um, we have sought to um, address the perhaps the particular um, you know, challenges that we faced in terms of the um, earnings uh, statistics. That's perhaps of particular relevance to our fiscal forecasts and particularly our income tax forecasts. Um, uh, I'm happy to go into the detail of that if, if, if necessary. Um, but I think our, our ask, if, if that's the best way to describe it in terms of um, improved um, information and data on um, price deflators and uh, em employment and wage information remains absolutely current. Um, we can do the best that we can do in our I remember saying that to you uh, at the, the, the previous time. We, we make the best assessment we can, but every improvement would would be of, of huge value to us. Uh, yes, so I mean, we've used the most up to date data available on Scottish earnings and, and wages. Um, uh, uh, how up to date is it? David? Uh, so, latest uh, uh, ASH survey, uh, <coughs> annual survey of hours and earnings, would have been published for March, April 2017. And that's an annual survey. Okay. Um, and um, the Scottish National Account statisticians take account of um, of all of that sort of data as well in producing their compensation of employees um, series, which we use. Um, and they then project that forward from the latest data to the latest quarter that they're publishing for using UK movements. Um, so we're using that information as well, although it's not Scottish specific. But really, um, as I think we said in our submission and we discussed when we were here before about economic data, exploring the possibilities of using more regular <coughs> UK-wide surveys, um, average weekly earnings, for example, and getting Scottish cuts of that information, perhaps looking into boosting if necessary, would be invaluable um, and for us to understand the more recent movements in wages, um, like we get for things like economic output. Um, other things that we you know, had to kind of work around were um, the components, the expenditure components that are published in the national accounts, which are very important for us to use um, in our economic models. Um, we have to deflate those, put them into real terms ourselves, because they're not published that way by the Scottish Government at the moment. And that was another thing which we mentioned in our um, response to your, your previous inquiry. Um, and, you know, those are, the National Account statisticians are obviously the experts in, in that data and how to do it. So if they published it on that basis, that would mean that um, it, both it was available for everybody to use in whichever way they wished and, and that we had it on a sort of consistent basis. So that, I mean, that would make things easier for us and also it would make it more accessible to other people. So those are examples of things that we've, we've sort of worked around, but it would be better if there was more information available. One of the points on wages specifically, uh, the information that we have is probably fine at the aggregate level. You know, if we're looking at trends over several years, the data we have is okay. What we're missing is the granularity and the detail to see what's happening in wages uh, from quarter to quarter, by age and gender, by different income groups. That's the sort of information that we're missing, so we can't explain in detail why what's been happening to wages has happened. We can only look at it at the most aggregated levels. And when we're, we've got a kind of micro simulation model in order to do our income tax forecast in particular, it's really critical that you get that kind of um, richness of data to be able to project forward. Yes, I mean, interested in your, you used the word critical there. I mean, how much of a difference would it make if you had, you know, if we could improve it? I mean, are we talking it's, it's a kind of marginal 
a effect or is it is it kind of major or is there any other word you would use in that kind of scale? I think that, that's that's quite difficult to say. Okay, right, um, I mean, I think that might be one of the things we can start, we can evaluate um, more in the future, um, you know, how, how we've performed um, for um, years where we don't have the full survey of personal incomes information compared to when we get that and how we've actually performed in terms of forecasting. And then when we get outturn data for income tax and, uh, you know, and how close we've got to projections of years that are past using data which are a few years out of date, that'll start to give us a feel for how much, you know, improvement you can make when the data is better. But, the, you know, we are still forecasting into the future. Yeah. So, I mean, inevitably, as you build up a, a record, yeah. as things are going to improve anyway, but okay. um, you are also still looking for improved data coming out of Scottish Government and HMRC. Yeah. That would be the main two, would they, on earnings? Uh, uh, and, and the ONS as yes. well, okay. um, for some of their UK-wide surveys, there's definitely potential there um, on earnings, yeah. But obviously, um, for our other, the other side of our house and on Social Security, we're, we're having to work with DWP as well to get good right. information. Yeah. I perhaps just want to maybe summarise and particularly point up. I, I think we're, we're satisfied that the, the capability that we've got, the information that we've got, enables us to give robust forecasts um, but you know it's almost a sort of a, a, you know a pursuit of you know every, you know continuous improvement and, and trying to you know ad identify where are the areas that can incrementally further improve what, what, what we're doing so it's just drawing a, a contrast um, I think on very very few of any of our areas would we say we just don't have the data we can't you know we, we can't produce something that we uh, would have, have con confidence in but perhaps in all of the areas that we forecast, there's always something that can give us more information, um, a more intuitive and more up-to-date feel of, of, of where we are. I think what we emphasised uh, to you as part of, of that particular inquiry is th th those two areas, and perhaps particularly um, contemporary information about um, about sort of wages and incomes, so that we can interpret what is going on in terms of our tax and fiscal forecasts uh, is, is certainly the area that um, would give me ever-increasing confidence in, in our forecasts. Okay, thanks so much. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Peter. Um, I, I'd like to still explore a little bit on productivity here, perhaps uh, one particular facet. And we've already talked about the fact that uh, weak output growth combined with the strong uh, labour market equals weak productivity growth. Now, you for forecast productivity in the next five years to be consistently lower than the OBR has for the UK as a whole. Maybe you could explain a little bit more detail about what leads you to that conclusion and why is Scotland different? Right. Um, perhaps the uh, headlines, uh, again, perhaps look to David in terms of the, the detailed uh, you know, modelling assessment on this is, um, you know, the Scottish economy for many structural uh, re reasons is different from the overall U UK economy and the overall long term experience has been um, that the, the long term <coughs> productivity performance has been that bit lower than the UK as a whole. Now, at different points of time, there's been a process of, of, of catch up and there have been uh, particular times where productivity has been, uh, has, has been you know, better than that. But in terms of, I think, most of the modelling assessments and most of the forecasting assessments for the Scottish economy is there has been a long-term um, you know, gap in terms of productivity performance between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and our broad judgment is that will continue. Now, the, the, um, what we have been at pains to emphasise in terms of our overall growth forecasts is that in terms of the headline growth forecast, they look very significantly lower than, than the UK, but there's a number of, there's a whole range of factors that underpin that, or go into that, and wider uh, demographics and, and other factors take into account. But the gap between our productivity growth assumption um, and, for example, the OBR's uh, productivity growth assumption um, is actually is, is much smaller, much more in line with perhaps the overall historical um, performance. Um, and in the way that we have developed th that overall assessment, um, what we 
What we do not do as a <coughs> modelling approach is to take the OBR's assessment, um, um, or whether it's the, the OBR or a range of other UK-wide you know, models and assumptions, um, and then say, well, we'll notch off 0.1 or 0.2 from their assessment here, or add you know, 0.1 or 0.2 there. That's not the approach we've taken. What, we've, what we have sought to do is make our own assessment of the overall um, you know, Scot Scottish performance, and that's led to um, our, our forecasts. So uh, I think in terms of the number of your question, reflects historical and structural factors uh, underpinning the, 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 the Scottish economy, but the productivity differential between Scotland and, and the UK is but one aspect, and, a, and um, a, you know, there, there are a number of other differential aspects which are perhaps crucially important um, you know, going forward. Perhaps, David, can you just give a bit more of assessment and comparison with the, the OBR? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's important to point out we didn't know where the OBR was going to be with their productivity forecast until quite late in the process of forming our own forecasts. Uh, they were only published a few weeks ahead of us. We had largely sort of closed down our forecasting process by then. Uh, our productivity forecasts didn't change much after that point. So as David said, we didn't form our forecast based on looking at the OBR's forecast for the UK. It was our own assessment of Scottish-specific factors, trends in Scotland. Um, and what we've seen is slow and slow, possibly slowing growth in productivity since around 2004, as we say in our report. We then looked at particular factors over the last four or five years um, to try and break down and get a better understanding of, of that growth in productivity. Um, and as we say in our report, uh, factors like the oil and gas industry, that was supporting growth in productivity uh, from 2010 to 2014. You had uh, a declining savings ratio in Scotland, again, supporting consumption, which in turn would support productivity growth. And once you strip out those factors, in addition, you see even more subdued growth in productivity. So that was our starting point. We, we had productivity growth over the last year, I think, of 0.2% or something, which is below uh, what's in our, our forecast period. And so that's our starting point. And then we we're just thinking about how that might grow over the next five years. It's... I wouldn't quite say it's coincidence, but us happening to be very close, you know, I think we're very close to where the OBR got to with the UK as well. That you know, we, we don't form our forecast by comparing ourselves to them. Just to ask a daft laddie question. This morning we've been talking a lot about uh, historic data, historic trends and all the rest of it. How do you determine how far to go back to determine those historic trends and historic data? Because obviously the economies of well, Scotland and England are changing all the time. When does it become irrelevant to do that comparison? I think, as everybody always says, the, the so-called dumb laddie questions are always the best questions, and that's absolutely you know, a cr crucial crux issue in, in this. Um, there's, a, there's an easy answer to that, is that you know, we, we use the data that we can rely on, which only goes back to a limited num number of years. So um, many of us would greatly... Um, want to have, or it would be a fascinating uh, sort of intellectual exercise almost to have really good uh, GDP assessments and national accounts going back over you know 10, 15, you know 20, 30 years. We don't have that. Um, we have you know we have robust quality information, and I, I should say at the risk of uh, you know, pointing out previous roles, but Mary had a huge amount to do when she, she ran the sort of national accounts uh, you know, process in, in the Scottish Government. So we use the, uh, particularly the national accounts and the GDP assessments uh, going back in as far as that they are robust to do, to do so. Um, but Using that, that judgment, I think what we have been describing this morning is um, using the evidence we've got, what we have had to make judgments about is which bits of that historical information are more relevant to thinking about the period going forward. How much do you look to the last year as driving the next few years? How much is it getting back to the experience you know, uh, pre-2008. So it's based on your best information and statistics of historical performance. Part of the, the judgment about forecasting is which bits of history are most relevant to take a view forward. But an essential underpinning part of that is to, to know and understand what has happened historically, and that's all, only over a relatively limited period. So how far back is that limited that time? Give you? The detailed national accounts are available back to 1998, but some of the other sources of information, some of the earnings sources, 
go back to the early 2000s. Um, so it's this sort, that's the sort of time period that we have for most of the information that we're dealing with. Um, you know, it's, more, it's more limited for things like the survey of personal incomes, which doesn't, doesn't go back um, too, so, too far. But sorry, can I just, can yeah. I just um, before David comes in, um, a good illustration of the, the differences in trends is from figure two in our report on the productivity growth, which shows the differences between the pre-2008 trend <laughs> and the post-2008 trend in productivity and where our forecast is sort of in between those two lines. And it shows what, you know, it's a big judgment to take um, which of those um, uh, average growth trends you, you feel like it's, it's sensible to be closer to. Um, and it is a big part of the judgment of forecasting. Um, but one of the classic breaks, obviously, in the last um, 20 years has been that 2008 financial crisis where, where something seems to have changed in the Scottish economy. Sorry, David. Uh, so in figure 2.1 of the report, it's somewhat arbitrary, but we break down the recent performance of the Scottish economy into three periods of time. Uh, so we've got the pre-2008 period, which we call sort of the long run stable trend. We've got the national accounts data back to 1998, but there is some avail information available much earlier than that. You can go back to the 60s and you do see quite smooth growth at around 2%. So that was our sort of, that's the long run trend point of the economy historically. You then got the financial crisis years, to so 2008 to 2010, that's when the economy was contracting. And then the starting point for our forecast is the period from 2010 onwards. That's what we say is sort of, uh, uh, the recent history of the economy that we're looking at, uh, over which period of time growth has averaged just 1.2%. So that's the period of time that we spent most most of our work scrutinising and trying to understand and break down that uh, sort of six or seven year period we feel is the most indicative of what's going to happen over the next few years. Do you work to any particular margin of error or do you acknowledge any margin of error? I think, as, as we were saying earlier, um, because we don't have a forecasting record, it's difficult for us to say um, what our historic forecasting errors have been and, and therefore um, how you should look at those in the context of um, of our previous forecasting errors. I think it's important where we, where we can to do, um, as we were talking about before, um, sensitivity analysis. So anyone reading a report has a real understanding of the key things, the key assumptions that we're making and what's really matters and what the forecast is really sensitive to, whether it's population or productivity or, or anything else. So that's what we can do in order to inform people who are reading a report about where the real uncertainties lie and what are the really key assumptions to get as close as you can to what actually ends up happening. Um, but as we build up a forecasting record, we'll be able to do more of that in terms of um, our, our, our historic um, errors. And maybe I'd just add a very brief point on, on that, is inevitably these forecasts will, we would not expect, and I would encourage you not to expect that, um, they will play out you know, precisely or exactly. This is a very uncertain uh, business we're, we're involved in. Um, but what we really want to, want to emphasise is if the economy... Um, plays out in a very different way than we were expecting, um, then it, you know, it, it, what we want to seek to evaluate and understand is well, you know, where might that difference come from and what implication would it have for the statistics? And that's why the sensitivity analysis we produced is, is so important. That in some sense, I think, as I mentioned in one of the questions earlier, if the productivity performance is actually much better than we expect, that might lead to a, a, a sort of, you know, a reaction somewhere else in the system, which might lead to low, lower <coughs> employment. If migration is lower than we expect, that will have an impact at somewhere else. And the, the, perhaps a key purpose of these um, forecasting models is, or a second purpose, you know, the first is the fiscal framework needs to have a set of estimates which needs to be used by the respective governments in terms of the fiscal process. But a second and very important purpose is you know, to understand systematically how the economy may actually differ from what we're, we're ex you know, e expecting um, and to ensure that we understand how it might differ. Um, and that's what we've come through. So uh, I hope the report um, adds to the consideration of where the, the various uh, impacts may, may change o over time. But certainly we should expect a margin of error because um, uh, that's the, the stuff of economic forecasting. I'll just we'll move you on to something slightly different. Um, we've heard from witnesses about the rise in job insecurity in the labour market. 
and the squeeze on earnings, both in Scotland and in the UK. Can you set out a bit more about uh, how you think conditions will look like in the labour market over, say, the next five years? Um, you know, un underpinning our forecasts, I, I we touched on uh, earlier, is our, our central uh, uh, you know, expectation is that productivity will remain relatively subdued, but employment and unemployment will um, remain at, um, uh, not only at record levels, but actually we're expecting further increases in employment and reductions in unemployment. I suppose in terms of what that will actually feel like on the ground um, or feel like in terms of the you know, labour market um, processes, I think um, it, it tells a story of a continuation of the sort of trends that we have been seeing in the, in the recent past. Many of which you've uh, you know drawn attention to um, the, the flexible labour market that we've um, we've seen across the UK um, uh, and and in, in Scotland is the key feature you know going going forward. So the issues about you know so-called precarious uh, employment, the trends um, between part-time, full-time, wider issues around the the gig economy, um, we haven't dwelled on that in any great detail in the report or drawn out the implications of that, but implicitly underpinning our forecasts is those sort of trends we would expect to continue. Um, so I, I, that's part of, the, part of the answer, I hope, um, to, to that question. I think a second point which is um, perhaps crucial in this is, um, and this probably goes beyond our, um, or getting to the point of into our five-year um, horizon. Um, a key issue which we would expect to be evaluating and looking at um, over the, the months and, and years ahead is the, the consequences <coughs> of any changes in the labour market as a result of um, the change in our relationship <coughs> with the EU. Um, if there is lower um, in-migration and perhaps it, um, changing <coughs> Out migration um, from Scotland that might lead to further pressures and changes in the labour market. Now, many people are speculating on what potential impact that would be. Um, we have yet to do full assessments of, of, of all of that, but if there is um, a situation where you've got high levels of employment, low levels of unemployment, and reduced migration, then that is an added and you know, reinforced dynamic in the labour market, um, which I think will be a key feature of our assessments in the future. Do you consider that changes in the labour market are subduing economic growth? This change in pattern of employment? Um, let me give you, you an answer that's using a phrase I used earlier. We, we both in Scotland and the UK, appear to be um, recovering from the recession uh, post-financial crash and have found ourselves in what's been described as a uh, low productivity growth, high employment scenario or, or equilibrium. That's where we appear to be, and at its heart, that's what our, our forecast uh, you expect that to continue. Um, so hampering economic growth depends how you uh, how you sort of define those terms. The fact that we've got record levels of employment, um, you know, in many ways is very positive thing, um, but that has had its consequences for, for productivity. So if I can slightly reframe re frame your question, um, do has the flexibility of the labour market across the UK and in Scotland in particular um, interacted with our productivity performance since, since the recession to lead us where we are? Undoubtedly, yes. The labour market has, has been an absolutely crucial um, f factor in that. Um, going forward, um, there is the potential, at least, that a different um, you know, scenario around uh, the availability of, of, of workers you know, post-Brexit. Um, some people are saying that might lead to um, uh, a potential um, limited availability of labour, which might lead to increased wages, which might lead to increased investment to improve our capital performance. Some people are saying this might be a positive. Others are saying it might lead to skill shortages and real constraints on economic activity. I'm sure we'll come back to these questions, but at the moment, underpinning our, our assessment it is simply a continuation of the, the, the labour market dynamics we've been seeing in the last few years. So over the next few years, you're not expecting an actual change to the composition of the labour market, more of the same? 
Um, in terms of the workings of the labour market around um, part-time, full-time, gig economy, I'd expect that very much to continue. Thank you. We'll move on to a question from Kezia Dugdale. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. I take you back to the issue of Brexit, please. Uh, your evidence suggests that the process of negotiating Brexit and indeed the final settlement will have a negative impact on Scotland's economy. I heard a little bit from Gordon MacDonald about uh, the factors around migration that you've built into that, but could you tell us what other headline assumptions you've made with regards to the final settlement on Brexit? Um, the headline response, I, I think, to that is we've, we've very much made a very broad brush assessment of the p potential effects of um, you know, any changes on our forecasts. Um, to be clear, what we have not done um, is assessed what might happen in the economy in the absence of any change um, and made a, a, an assessment of what will happen if the, the, there is a change. That's not the way we, both ourselves and the, um, the Office of Budget Responsibility have approached um, the, the forecasts. What we've done is tried to factor into our overall um, you know, assessment of, of, of growth um, over the next five years um, a broad brush set of assumptions, as we've called them, which would uh, which would include both the short-term impact of uncertainty and you know, the process of, of changes that might happen, um, but also include a sort of broad assessment of what that might mean over the, over the longer term. Although realistically, with the transition period that is being talked about at the moment, any um, impact of you know, active working out with the EU would be very much to the end of our, our forecasts. So broad brush uh, um, assessment, broadly in line with what the OBR have done for the, for the UK as a whole, and deliberately designed to um, cover a range of different scenarios or outcomes of the negotiation process. Because, obviously, I, I, as you know, there isn't a, a firm picture of precisely what is the end point for, for, um, for us to evaluate and factor into to the forecast. So what we've done would cover a range of different outcomes of the process that's going on at the moment. Possibly a wise move. Um, but can I ask you more specifically about, say, for example, the, the single market? What, what assumptions have you made about us either being a, a member of or as close to a full member of the single market as possible? Um, the, the broad brush assumption effectively, and again, um, the, similar to what the OBR have done, we've, uh, we've, in as far as we can, we have assumed what the UK government have said their policy approach would be uh, going forward, and particularly taking into account the speeches that the, um, the Prime Minister has made in terms of her Lancaster House speech and the, the, the Florence speech, and that set out the broad um, you know, direction that the UK government is following, and that's the, um, that, that is the background for our assessment. As I've said, as you've, uh, you, you've acknowledged, the precise detail of how that plays out, we've, we've deliberately designed a range of, um, you know, a, a broad brush assessment to cover a range of different outcomes within the broad direction of what the UK government are seeking to negotiate at present. And just for the sake of the record, that therefore assumes that the United Kingdom is leaving the single market in the context of your projections. Well, in, in, that, that is the UK government policy at the moment. So that's, the, that, that's what we have taken as the, the core driver of the, you know, the, the policy approach, which is impacting on the UK and the, and the Scottish economy. But again, to emphasise what we have not done is a, you know, a detailed assessment of the, the impact on trade, the impact of the, both the short and the, the medium term uh, periods, like I know some other um, you know, organisations have done. That's not the purpose of, of our exercise. We've taken into account a broad brush set of assumptions which impact alongside all of the other um, tailwinds, headwinds and factors that are affecting the economy and factored into our overall assessment. And in your earlier remarks, you said that the impact of Brexit would be minimal in the short term because you're projecting five years ahead. It's not as significant as you might commonly expect it to be. Why is that? Is that because the current rates of growth are so subdued that any further uh, instability isn't really going to have a dramatic effect? And what can you tell us about what will happen five years hence? Is that when you'd expect quite a, a steep rise or indeed fall in, in economic activity? Um, I, th I think I was just trying to you know, emphasise that if... If the timetable for leaving the EU was to be sort of spring 2019 plus a two-year tra transition period, it would be you know into 2021. So actually, the period that on the current timetable set out by the UK government for um, you know, the UK to be in the 
post-transition new arrangements would be the, uh, effectively the final year of our forecast. So there would be some time um, to, to, to get there. Over, over the you know, future months and years, we will be fine-tuning and developing that forecast, but at the moment, well, we've, we have not done uh, an assessment of what the potential implications would be for our growth forecasts of the, the new arrangements um, post the transition period, simply because we don't know or we don't have the details of, of what they are. It would be unreasonable to expect us to do an assessment of them. And just finally, are you in any sense drawn to reconsidering your forecast in light of perhaps staying in the single market? Would that um, change things markedly? Um, uh, in as far as we, you know, our, our role is to assess what the um, the economic pitch would be based on current Scottish government policy, uh, and uh, and we, we have interpreted our broad assessment as to include current UK government policy. So that we are doing the assessment based on the stated policies of both governments. Um, it's not our role to um, do any assessment based on what the government may or may not do in the future or the impact of the range of policy options that the government have in the future. So at the moment, we, we are simply assessing in the broad terms I've described the current trajectory of UK government policy. So that's a no? Uh, it, um, it's what I said. <laughs> Thank you, convener. All right. Jackie Bailey. I wonder whether I could ask just a, a number of very quick questions, convener. Um, I understand you've used a supply-led model of forecasting rather than a demand one. For those of us that aren't economists, could you explain why and would it have made a difference to your ultimate forecast? I'll perhaps leave our head of economic <laughs> forecasting to give you an answer to that. Uh, so we use both. We consider both the supply and the demand side of the economy. We don't exclusively look at one or the other. Um, for near-term economic performance, I think we place more emphasis on the demand side of the economy, so how much money are people spending today? Uh, we've got some short-term models that look at the available data, what's coming through in the surveys, things like uh, business expectations, and we use that to drive our forecast over the next few quarters and first couple of years. Over the longer term, our for you know we need something to anchor our forecast on. What, what's, it what's the economy going to look like in five years' time? And I think to make that assessment, you have to start thinking about things like population and demographics, and longer term trends in the labour market, and then also ultimately longer term trends in productivity. So for that five or six year outlook, we place more emphasis on the supply side of the economy. Uh, but then what our models do is they bring the supply and demand side together to form a complete picture of the economy over that five-year period. So we don't exclusively look at one or the other. Okay, great. That's helpful to know. Um, can I ask you about um, the impact of offshore, the offshore economy on the onshore economy? Because I understand you've clearly separated the two, and that's rightly so. But when you think about the northeast, the impact of the offshore economy um, you know, is, is evident for all to see. Given that there is a slight upturn um, in the price of a barrel of oil, which I hope is sustainable in the long term, um, I'm keen to know that that positive impact is captured in your modelling as well. Yeah, I'll just briefly, and again, perhaps pass to David. Um, I, I, I think the, um, the higher oil price that we've been seeing in the last uh, few months um, is, is clearly a positive factor in terms of overall activity. Um, you know, for, and I think uh, all of the uh, committee will, will recognise our forecasts are onshore GDP, as you've described, rather than the, the offshore activity, but there's a very strong I interaction, and the, we we have based our assessment on, uh, I think, a quite close reading and uh, you know, analysis of, of the current activities and future activities in, in the North Sea, very much uh, recognising the industry views, you know, like what the likes of Oil and Gas uh, UK um, have, have said. But it, it is a very broad brush assumption, uh, again, in terms of forecast. I, I would not be saying um, that the more recent upturn in oil prices over the last, um, you know, the last few weeks would lead us to any rethink of the, you know, the, the detail of what we're saying. But in as far as the oil prices are higher, there's also been some positive announcements in terms of um, you know, overall um, exploration and production. Uh, I think this is further indication that the, the oil and gas sector has moved from, uh, I think, an exceptionally buoyant 
period up to um, around 2014 and that the, the oil price fall at the start of 2015, uh, perhaps a period of sharp retrenchment that you'd expect, and it's now getting back to um, making the sort of significant positive contribution to, to the economy going forward, but not at a level that we saw in the early parts of, of, of this decade. So yes, good news, wouldn't expect it to fundamentally you know, change our overall assessment. Okay. Um, can I move on to productivity very quickly? Um, we, we've always been told, that, well, in recent uh, months, that productivity is increasing rapidly, but I understand from your paper um, that it's largely unchanged since 2015. Um, now, it, let me just pose a question in relation to unemployment, because there are studies from, I believe, Sheffield University that talk about the underlying level of unemployment being much greater than the official statistics, um, I think almost double in some cases. Um, did, you, did you assess that data? Because to me, that's potentially where there is productive potential. I, I, I think in, in headline, what we've mainly assessed is this sort of balance between um, you know, overall productivity and, and employment. Um, where there, you know, and this is why we were so keen to do the, the sensitivity analysis, there is potentially scope for the, you know, you know, in the economy for those that are already in work to work more in terms of increased hours worked. There is a potential for boosting the um, productive capacity of the economy by um, reducing economic inactivity, uh, again, bringing that um, back into the economy. So in as far as um, there, um, is, you know, there are areas where there could be an increase in, in capacity, likewise, I you know, share the view that's a potential sensitivity that might lead to both, by definition, an increase in employment and it might you know, boost GDP. But I think what I was trying to get at earlier, that there is, there's, um, there's a balancing act here. If there's more people in work, more people you know, work, working longer hours, um, that might lead to weaker growth in productivity and vice versa. And that's the balancing act we need to go, to, to go forward. But I think it links back to John Mason's question earlier about wages and employment activity, better understanding of um, where we can uh, potentially bring more people back into the labour market, uh, particularly where the labour market is at hi um, high levels of employment, is, is an area that potentially can both boost economic activity, but also can you know, impact on wider uh, you know, uh, social objectives, reduce poverty and, uh, and others, and that's certainly an area that, um, uh, that could be looked at further. But, but you seem to suggest that it, because you believe we're operating above capacity, that there's an inherent um, structural problem in our economy. It's not just a temporary weakness we can you know, apply a little policy to um, and massage away. There's something more fundamental going on um, that, that suggests there is a problem. There's something more fundamental, and that's back to the productivity levels and the overall okay. performance of the economy. Thank you very much. All right. Are there any further questions from committee members? Certainly, quick, Jamie Halk. Quick, quick question. Sorry, just on, on the back of what you've been talking there with um, with Jackie Bailey, and also um, your, uh, your 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 um, predictions for what you call subdued growth kind of going forward. Are there any particular individual sectors that you are for, forecasting or able to identify as perhaps more um, uh, more likely to suffer from subdued growth or, or, or lack of growth? Yeah, I, mean, I think the areas that perhaps we've touched on, in in the sense that they are contributing less than. Previously to the overall performance of the economy, we mentioned at oil and gas uh, construction and, and other areas. Um, for the economy to um, show uh, <coughs> or for, for the performance of the economy to be, in one sense, better than we are, are forecasting, we'd certainly look to the manufacturing sector to be further boosting its, its uh, productivity. Um, and we'd expect, for example, you know, oil and gas, which has been a key, key driver. But the, the areas of the economy which have shown uh, strong productivity performance are, are perhaps uh, those ones. Um, but to lead to strong improvements in productivity, you'd, you'd expect that to see that across the economy as a whole, in you know, productivity in services, in government activities, health service and others will be you know, a key factor in contributing to the overall performance of the economy. Again, perhaps I don't know if any of my colleagues want to comment. No. no. Okay. No.
There are no further questions in that case. Um, I will thank um, all of you for coming in today. Thank you very much. And I'll now suspend the session. We'll move into private session. <laughs>